Released in 1986, Flight of the Navigator tells the story of 12-year-old David Freeman, a typical kid who lives in 1978. One night while searching for his brother in the woods, he falls down a ditch and upon returning to his home, finds that different people now live in his house. David then discovers that eight years have passed since he returned from the woods, of which felt like minutes to him. Once reunited with his family, NASA wants to run experiments to find out what exactly happened to David and why he hasn't aged. While examining his head, NASA discovers blueprints of a spaceship that the organization had previously discovered, which is also being stored at the NASA headquarters. David can sense the ship calling out to him, where he sneaks on board the ship, where he sets out on an adventure like no other, where he discovers through the ship's robotic commander, Max, voiced by Paul Rubens, that he is the ship's navigator, and that David's time loss was the result of a failed specimen research experiment mission, and that the ship requires the information within David's brain. Fly to the Navigator is a typical post-Star Wars and E.T. space adventure movie where we get to see every kid's ultimate dream. To be in charge of their very own spaceship. So today we are going to navigate through this cult classic by looking into 10 things that you may not know about Flight of the Navigator. Let's go! You know something? You're a weird kid. Me? I'm not the one with the purple hair. Number 10. The director also directed a famous musical. Flight of the Navigator was directed by Randall Kleiser, who is probably most well known for directing the hit musical Grease eight years earlier in 1978. The smash hit 1950s themed teenage musical has gone on to become one of the greatest musical movie adaptations of all time, up there with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I can't help but feel like there are small winks and nudges to Grease within Flight of the Navigator. For example, the first part of the movie is set in 1978, the same year that Grease came out. And there is one scene where we see the Freeman family driving around in their family car with You're the One That I Want playing on the car radio. Kleiser also directed The Blue Lagoon and would go on to direct Big Top Pee Wee, which, like Flight of the Navigator, also featured Paul Rubens, along with White Fang and Honey I Blew Up the Kid. Hold it. Now this is music. Number 9. Surprise Filming Location Flight of the Navigator was mainly filmed in Florida, as you can see by many of the beautiful sunshine shots displayed with great scenery of the southeast US state. The film was going to be filmed in Los Angeles and Dallas, but bad weather got in the way, leading the filming to be taking place in Florida. The NASA headquarters and David's bedroom were in fact filmed at Miami's Limelight Studio sound stages. However, you may be surprised to know that some of the movie's filming also took place in Norway, namely the outskirts of Oslo. The main filming that took place in the Scandinavian country were shots of the spaceship. Flight of the Navigator was originally an independent production that was being produced by a Norway production company called Viking Film, which sadly went bankrupt during the movie's production. Number 8. Disney didn't have much faith in the movie. So when Viking Film went bankrupt, the project was offered to Disney, who agreed to fund the rest of the movie. But sadly, when it came time to releasing the movie, I don't think Disney knew quite what to do with Flight of the Navigator. They were probably a bit cautious after the disappointing performance of the previous year's Return to Oz. So the company pitched the movie to producers' sales organization, which mainly handled overseas sales of movie rights. Producers sales organization struck a deal with Disney for both companies to distribute Flight of the Navigator, which meant that Disney would mainly distribute the movie's US release. Which probably explains why, with its Australian release, Flight of the Navigator was released by Roadshow, which is an Australian division of Warner Brothers, and would go on to distribute the Matrix films. And in a twist of irony, producers sales organization would go bankrupt in 1986, the very year Flight of the Navigator was released. And I'm not kidding, in Australia, Flight of the Navigator was released under Roadshow, as you can see here with this DVD. There is absolutely no sign of Disney in sight. 
I was actually shocked to find out later in life that Flight of the Navigator is a Disney film. Number seven, Paul Rubin's credit joke. No, 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 no. By the time Flight of the Navigator was to be released, Paul Rubens, who comedically voiced the spaceship, AKA Max, was already something of a household name, as his famous character, Pee Wee Herman, having previously starred in Tim Burton's Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and the same year as Flight of the Navigator was released, his hit TV series, Pee Wee's Playhouse, debuted on CBS. However, despite the fact that you don't actually see Rubens in Flight of the Navigator, and that his contribution to the movie was entirely voice work, the actor thought it would be funny for him to be cast as Paul Mall. I don't know if this was seen as a hilarious joke, or if it was done in part so his performance as Max wouldn't be compared to Pee Wee Herman. Hey, Blimbo! Oink, oink. Too many Twinkies! <laughs> but, Paul Mall it was. Number six, Awesome Toys Product Placement. So there is a scene where David is taken to his NASA bedroom, where he is greeted with some gifts by the organization. And it's a sort of blink and you'll miss it moment. And in case you miss exactly what David was given, luckily I am here to tell you exactly what NASA had to offer the young lad, as he was given a G.I. Joe Cobra Moccasin, a Space Turbo Mini Arcade, a Constellation Finder, a space shuttle toy, a Porsche 935 radio control car, a Panasonic portable radio cassette player, a Franklin Glowbright Orange Mike Schmidt baseball, a baseball glove, a Felix the Cat plush toy, and the feast of resistance of this collection, a Transformers Decepticon shrapnel, possibly making this room the ultimate dream of any 80s kid. Still, I think the fact that NASA was playing with G.I. Joe Cobra toys and Transformers Decepticon should have been a sign that they were up to no good. Number five, the music of Flight of the Navigator. The score for Flight of the Navigator was provided by movie composing legend Alan Silvestri. Just one year earlier, Silvestri struck gold with composing music for Back to the Future. So naturally he was in demand at the time. And some of his music in Flight of the Navigator sounds great and has a sense of wonderment. But sadly to me, in my own humble opinion of course, some of his music sounds a bit too synthesized and pop for my likings. And sounds aged now compared to his other more timeless scores. Once again, this is just an opinion, but some of the more funky, upbeat tunes sound more like a 1980s aerobicizing video. This could be because in Back to the Future he was using an orchestra, whereas in Fly to the Navigator the music was scored electronically. As for the main theme played at the start of the movie, well, to me, it just sounds... well... weird. But I digress, it's a good score and has plenty of excitement. And when the music for Flight of the Navigator works, it works very well. But when it doesn't work too well, well, it doesn't. Who Juicy? Twisted Sister. Never heard of her. It's a him. Number four, Fate of the Ship. One of the most impressive aspects of Flight of the Navigator is the shiny and sleek silver spaceship. In order to create the groundbreaking spaceship, early CGI was used. And as a kid, I freaking loved the effects used for the spaceship. I loved how it was organic and how it could morph and change shape. It made it seem like an organic living metal. Even to this day, I still think the spaceship effects look pretty awesome. Sadly, the fate of the actual spaceship wouldn't be so glorious, as one of the two main prop ships that were used for the film was sent to a back lot at the Walt Disney World theme park in Florida, where it was put on display for back tours. And it's kind of tragic seeing this once great and iconic part of my childhood collect dust and just look so worn down. The other prop ship was also sent to Walt Disney World, where it's part of a display at Tomorrowland at Magic Kingdom, where sadly, it now looks like this. Number three, Sarah Jessica Parker's paycheck. The biggest star attached to Flight of the Navigator other than Paul Rubens is of course the performance from a very young Sarah Jessica Parker, who played Carolyn McAdams, a young worker at NASA. Prior to Flight of the Navigator, she already appeared in Footloose and Girls Just Wanna Have Fun. 
and after Fly to the Navigator, she would continue her career appearing in Hocus Pocus and Edward, but she would eventually get cemented in pop culture for her role in the hit TV series Sex and the City, which would put her into superstardom status. However, it seems that nowadays she doesn't seem to have any love for Fly to the Navigator or her experience on working on the movie. When asked in a 2018 interview what drew her to her role in Fly to the Navigator, she didn't seem too enthusiastic to talk about it, or even remember it for that matter. She revealed that nothing drew her to the part. It was just a job, so she went and did it simple as that. It was nothing more than a paycheck to her. She further added she doesn't even know what the movie was about or who her character was, but to her it was just merely a part. To be fair to Sarah Jessica Parker though, the film was made a very long time ago and her part in it was a minor one and she has been in tons of movies since. But seriously though, how could she forget working with that robot? I bet that really hurts the robot's feelings. Oh well, come on Ruff. Come on Ruffy baby. Number 2. Flight of the Box Office Flight of the Navigator was made on a budget of $9 million and made back $18 million, so it did recoup its budget, but it wasn't a knockout success either, leaving the movie performing poorly at the box office, despite going on to become a cult classic. Flight of the Navigator has all the hallmarks of being a fun adventure kids space fantasy movie. So why didn't it catch on? Well, it could be because the premise of the movie was a kid being in control of his own spaceship, which is a fun premise, but had just previously been done one year prior in Joe Dante's Explorers. So maybe it was just released too close to that movie and the whole kids having an adventure in a spaceship theme had already been done. Ironically, it was released the same day as Howard the Duck, which was a total box office disaster, along with Friday the 13th 7 Jason Lives, which although made $19 million, still wasn't too spectacular. At that time in the box office, the movie that beat all the other movies that I've already mentioned was a Tom Hanks comedy called Nothing In Common. Ah yes, Nothing In Common. The movie where... Um, stuff happens? Yeah, I've got no idea what this movie is. I guess you could say, I got nothing in common with it, eh? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Number one, failed remake. There have been several announcements that there will indeed be a reboot of Flight of the Navigator, but as of 2019, nothing has happened. In 2009, it was announced that Arrested Development and My Name is Earl writer Brad Copeland was writing a script for the remake, but nothing came of it. Then in 2012, the remake reared its head again, this time with claims that Disney had hired director Colin Trevorrow to direct the upcoming remake. But once again, nothing happened, and Trevorrow went on to direct Jurassic World instead. Then once again in 2017, it was announced that the Jim Henson production company were now in charge of the Flight of the Navigator remake. But still, yet again, two years later, nothing set in stone. With all these plans being announced with the project constantly going nowhere, it's like the universe itself is trying to send a message to these filmmakers. Hmm, I can't imagine what that message is. Sarcasm. Flight of the Navigator is an enjoyable children's science fiction adventure. It's lots of fun and full of nostalgia, and it's definitely a product of its time. If you haven't seen the movie in a while, I say give it another viewing, and you will see that it does have all the makings of a cult classic. Anyway, I'm Minty, and does anyone else see the irony in Sarah Jessica Parker losing her memory of Flight of the Navigator? Which in part is a movie about losing your memory? Hmm...